We look today, Hebrews 11, 29, continuing where we were with the great heroes of the faith, and now today we have the application of it. And so we begin at verse 29, Hebrews 11, by faith... The people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned by faith. The walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Baruch, Samson, and Jephthah about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily ensnares, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our redeemer. Amen. Amen. With such a passage, I sort of feel out of breath just in the reading of it because it just is overwhelming. Um, The first half obviously gives more examples of people of the faith. The... uh, I call it the second half. It's actually chapter 12 and those first two verses show us the greatest witness of faith, Jesus. And of course, this has been pointed out, there is the word therefore. And anytime you have the word therefore, you look and see what therefore is there for. And the therefore has reference to all these in chapter 11 that are heroes of the faith. And we begin at 29 by faith, literally they. NIV says, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Now, the previous verses have been talking about Moses, and the point in 29 is the same faith that lived in Moses lives also in the people. Why? Because they were able to do something the Egyptians could not do. By faith, they walked through. That's indicating that every one of the people who walked through the Red Sea, alternate translation, Reed Sea, uh, had faith. And there is the old Jewish myth that the sea didn't actually part until the first Jew stepped out into the water. And with that act of faith, the sea parted before them. And then you have the Egyptians following behind. Now, I know in the movie that that Pharaoh does not die, but he actually did. Because if he hadn't, the people would have legally still been slaves in Pharaoh's death. 
Pharaoh was an interesting monarch because of uh, the the uh, famine and 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 the the grain. Pharaoh actually owned the country. He wasn't just king; he had title to the land. He owned all the property that did not belong to the priests, and they were a slave people. And if you recall. Um, they tell Pharaoh, we want to go out here and worship our God. And had Pharaoh not died, they would have had to do that. But in the death of Pharaoh, and I agree it's fudging the point because they actually are across the sea before Pharaoh dies. But anyway, they're they're being chased across, and you can say it was the chasing across that, that caused them to go. But they do something by faith, the Egyptians cannot do. They go through the water, and um, various images pop through my mind of people uh, going through like it's the aquarium. Debbie and I went through uh, the aquarium at, at Gatlinburg last time we were up in the mountains, and you've got this cylinder made out of hopefully very, very thick uh, material of some type, a new site or something along those lines. And the, the animals, especially the sharks, you know, they'll follow me every time they look at that chubby one. Let's, let, <laughs> <laughs> I want to get a bite out of him. You know, and, 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 and so the images come to mind. However, it worked out in mechanics. Uh, People have looked at the idea that a strong sea, and there are examples where that particular body of water has had a wind blow such that uh, a portion that had been covered in water uh, was dry and dry enough that people can walk there and chariots cannot. And some people need those kind of images. I don't personally. I don't think we're supposed to try to explain miracles, but that's the image. Not only Moses is a, pe- a person of faith, but the people that follow Moses, at least initially, are people of faith. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. Literally, there it says, after uh, the army had circled uh, the walls for seven days. And so you've got that in... Uh, in in, uh, uh, Joshua chapter 6 at 5 at the tail end of 5 is my favorite story in Hebrew scripture and as as, as, uh, Joshua goes and approaches the walls there is this huge man in armor I mean, by himself, he was their equivalent of an M1 Abrams tank by himself. And he's just there. And so Joshua asks the very obvious question, are you for us? Are you for our enemy? And he says, neither. But as the captain of the army of hosts, I have now come. I personally believe that was Jesus captain of the army of hosts. He instructs Joshua, take off your sandals, the ground you're standing on is holy. And that's the proof I need to believe that is uh, divinity because angels do not declare um, worship for themselves. You see that over in Revelation. Do not worship me. You know, you're either creator or created and only worship creator. And so Obviously, this captain of the army of the hosts, what hosts? Hosts of heaven. And and I love that line, but as the captain of the army of the Lord of hosts, I have now come. Which is to say, God doesn't take sides, God takes over. And so you have that imagery, and he's the one that gives the instructions about marching, and after seven days, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, the prostitute Rahab. By the way, Rahab is uh, uh, grandmother to uh, another famous guy. Does anybody? Is it grandmother? King David. King David. Mm-hmm. 
What's wrong with that imagery? <laughs> the prostitute Rahab. She's also Jesus's great, 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 you know, grandmother. Um, what's wrong with this image? Not only is she a prostitute, she's not Hebrew. She's a non-Israelite. And and uh, I want to read... I, you could read all of this and have an interesting event. But uh, Joshua chapter 2. Uh, the king of Jericho was told, verse 2, the king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered, the ha- entered your house because they've come out to spy out the land. Uh, but the woman who had taken the two men and hidden them said, Yes, the men came to me, but I do not know where they came from at dusk. As it was time to close the city gates, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go quickly. You may catch up to them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid on the roof. And so that story continues on. It's a great story to read the kiddies. Uh, why does she do this? Verse 8. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did and yada, yada, yada. Our hearts melted in fear. Why? For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. That's a statement of faith. Why? She has faith. She's not, she's the wrong gender, wrong occupation, wrong nationality, wrong everything. She's got faith. She makes it to the list. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, when she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Why were they disobedient? She says that the whole people have hearts melting in fear. She's the only one that tries to make peace, that tries to live into the will of God. The others are scared, but they stay in their fear and don't do anything uh, to address the fact that if God is God... I need to be on God's side. And what more shall we say? Now here is vivid imageries and unforgettable phrases. It's a snapshot. It's just very quickly. He says, I do not have time to tell. Sound like a preacher, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I do not have. But then he goes ahead and gives these images and phrases. Scholars think this is actually a sermon. And that's why he says, I do not have time to tell, and then just gives a word here, a word there, so that you have going off in your mind these little photographic images of who he's talking about. I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Baruch, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms administered justice and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions all right who was that shut the mouths of lions there's three your answer could be one of three men daniel is the most obvious samson samson there's one more David. David. When he was a uh, when he was, when a, he was shepherd. a shepherd, not only bears but lions, quenched the fury of the flames. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and the Abednego. Yeah, uh, S. M. Lockridge, who does that sermon that you may have heard. My king is a seven way king, the king of Israel. You know, is a national king. Does that make? All right. If you watch YouTube, look up S.M. Lockridge. S.M. is Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge. Dr. S.M. Lockridge, when he talks about, oh, by the way, his house burned down, and so his friends called him Shadrach, Meshach, Noshach. But anyway, (laughs) that's just preachers. Um, He's saying this back in the 50s. He said the first time he heard that, he thought the preacher was reading Shadrach, Meshach, and a big Negro. 
<laughs> he's a black man. He's a black man anyway. But he's, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and I, I've heard that last guy always gets the butt of the joke. I've heard Shadrach, Meshach, and Big Mac. I mean, it just, anyway. Shadrach, Meshach, and Tibet. And Tibet. And Tibet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he's the one that always, but, uh, you know, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned to strength. Now, we don't know whose weakness was turned. Some of these images are not specific to a particular person that we can lock down for sure, uh, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead. All right, Now, that's two that you could name there. Um, anybody want to uh, shoot at that. Uh huh. Widow of Zarephath, and then the next one is Elisha, Elijah, and then Elisha raised uh, the, the Shunammite. Son. No, it's, it was the Shunammite woman. Oh, okay. Uh, it was the widow of Zarephath's son. No, no, no. It was it was the Shunammite woman's son. You're right. Okay. You're right. It was. Yeah, it was the son. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Who are they talking about? The martyrs, but what martyrs? This is not in our Bible. This is in the 13 books of the Bible that is used by the Roman Catholics and by the Orthodox. When Martin Luther did his translation of uh, the Bible into High German in the 16th century, he did an interesting thing. When it came time to translate the Old Testament, he went to the synagogue and asked the Jews, what do y'all consider Bible? And so they gave them the books that we currently, we Protestants currently have. And that left 13 and and the Jews had 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 to come to the place they decided what's scripture and what's just good stuff. And uh, they came up with thirteen books. And and one of the things is the original had to have been written in Hebrew. Um, and so they had thirteen books that were written between the canon of Hebrew scripture closing and the New Testament opening. And they were written in Greek for Greek-speaking Jews who uh, live in that time between the, the prophets and, and Jesus. That's a 400-year gap, and uh, it's the Maccabean Antiochus IV Epiphanes sacrifices a pig on the high altar in Jerusalem. And you have the... Uh, uh, the miracle of the Feast of Lights. They've got oil for one day, and it lasts eight days. And so we've got Hanukkah. By the way, Jesus observed Hanukkah. It's in the Scripture. But uh, our Jewish friends, instead of observing Christmas, will observe Hanukkah. And, and that was the Maccabean period when basically uh, the Greeks were trying to un-Judaize the Jews. And the big thing was them making them eat pork. But like I said, Antiochus sacrifices the pig on uh, the high altar, which is not something you do to make Jews happy. And so at uh, 2 Maccabees 6 and 18, there was an elderly man, highly respected teacher of law by the name of Eleazar, whose mouth was being forced open to make him eat pork. But he preferred an honorable death rather than a life of disgrace. So he spit out the meat and went willingly to the place of torture, showing how people should have courage to refuse unclean food, even if it cost them their lives. It goes on and says he's 90 years of age, yada, yada. Next chapter, a mother and her sons die for their faith. Seven sons arrested with a Jewish mother king, uh, having them beaten to force them to eat pork. Then one of the young men said, what do you hope to gain by doing this? We would rather die than abandon the tradition of our ancestors. And so evidently, 
that's what's being referred to when it says uh, others were tortured, refusing to be released. The first guy I read about, the 90-year-old, he could have been released by eating the pork chop. The mother and her seven sons could have been released by eating the pork chop. They didn't eat the pork chop. Paul causes Peter a... uh, Words slip from my mind. Book is Galatians chapter 2. Hypocrite. Thank you, Lord. Calls him a hypocrite because he's at the church social and he's eating a pork chop. This is Peter after Joppa, the rooftop, where he's had this image, Ron's Peter, kill and eat. Don't call unclean what I have called clean. He's eating the pork chop at the church social. And then the people from Jerusalem come in, and Peter goes over and scrapes the pork chop off into the garbage barrel and goes over and sits and pretends like nothing has ever touched his mouth that would be Jewish ceremonially unclean. This just sets Paul off. And he goes over to Peter and to his face calls him, You hypocrite! And there's a longer speech there, but you can look it up, Galatians chapter 2. So that they might gain an even better resurrection. What's a better resurrection? I thought, resurrection, resurrection, you know. Well, in Hebrew scripture, the Shunammite woman, uh, the widow of Zarephath, all experience resurrection both experience resurrection of children but they're children who have died recently and so actually it's resuscitation that's why it's a big deal in in um, uh, John's gospel when Mary and Martha receive back their brother Lazarus because he's been dead How many days? Three. Four. Four. Four Four days. Why four? Four is more than three. Four is long enough that he has started to rot. And so the better resurrection is not resuscitation, you know, jump start the heart. The better resurrection is to live into the kingdom of God, to have the resurrection of Jesus. And all the imagery here is around what in Hebrew scripture would have been called uh, uh, the restoration of Israel. But in New Testament, it would be the kingdom of God. It's not just resuscitation. It's an entirely new life. Um, Also in Kings, there is a woman that was older and she was promised a child and then that child died, and she went after the prophet. Prophet, the widow of Zarephath. Zarephath, First yeah. Kings seventeen. Uh, uh, that they might gain an even better resurrection, not just resuscitation, because those that are, you know, the story is told that Lazarus dies again. Now that's not scripture, but that's an assumption. By the way, Ben Witherington III, professor of New Testament at Asbury, swears the Gospel of John was written by Lazarus. Stop and hear the argument. Stop and hear the argument. One thing is, in, in, uh, in, in chapter 21, is it 21? The last chapter of the Gospel of John, it talks about... Uh, you know, if he lives forever, what is that to you? Because the, well, why would he live forever? Because it's Lazarus who's had the resurrection, not from Hebrew scripture, but from uh, New Testament. But there's two other points that uh, Witherington makes. One is that Lazarus, the John is never is never mentioned by name internally. How does, how does the book of John refer to the author? The one that Jesus loved. What does Mary and Martha send in message to Jesus to get him to come to raise the dead brother? The one whom you love. Now, I'm not saying it is John. I'm saying that BW3 makes a terribly good argument. 
in heaven will know. On earth, it's it's hypothesis. But in, anyway, what do you think someone was saying by now? <laughs> we may have we may have but anyway the better resurrection some faced jeers and flogging even chains and imprisonment they were put to death by stoning they were sawed in two tradition says Isaiah was sawn in two and and me being me I'm wondering lengthwise or sideways I'd rather have sideways but anyway be over quicker maybe <laughs> they were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. What's being described there is the early monastic community that doesn't originate with Jesus, but actually prefigures Jesus. They had Jewish monks wandering in the desert and byways. John the Baptizer was just the last in a long lineage of Old Testament uh, monks. And uh, you know the, the, the Qumran scrolls, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls? Y'all remember hearing about the Dead Sea Scrolls? Right. That came from a, uh, a desert monastic community. Jewish community and uh, what's so great is you've got these scrolls that are so much older than anything we had and basically they give testimony to the fact that we've got accurate Bible you know it had to have God's hand on it to be transmitted as accurately as it has been over the years weren't they discovered in 1948? I think so 48-49 a shepherd boy throwing a rock at a lamb hears a clink where the jar breaks and he goes up yeah. to see. And anyway, the whole thing is now on the internet. Yeah. You, know, you can read the whole thing. So, anyway, they wandered in deserts, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Literally translated there, it's yet none of them received the promise the promise not what had been promised what had been promised is like you know a culmination of things the promise we today would call the kingdom they would call the restoration you know what what is it that the disciples ask acts 1 uh, at, at, at the ascension you know is, uh, is now the time you will restore the kingdom to Israel that's the one thing they wanted. They still don't understand. No, you go pray, get unity, and you'll get your instructions. And so the Holy Spirit falls on them, Acts 2. But they're still wanting the kingdom restored because they're still thinking of the kingdom as being a physical place and especially a military power. Ah, not it. Yet none of them received the promise since God had planned something better for us. Now, NIV, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. The, the accurate literal translation, lest without us they should be made perfect. See, he says God provided something better for us so they wouldn't be made perfect without us. And, and all the imagery is God has this idea of, of, of how many and who he, he God wants. And, and he, he wasn't satisfied with just Hebrew Scripture saints. He wants Jesus saints too. What is it to be made perfect? It is not necessarily talking about the absence of of any mistakes. That's where perfectionism comes from. The word there in the Greek, teleos. When Jesus said, you be perfect even as my Father in heaven is perfect, it was teleos. I like the translation complete, whole. 
I've used this imagery before about the shot glass and the Olympic size swimming pool. You can get them both full to the point that if you add one drop to either, something's coming out. And yet, would you say they hold the same amount? No, but they're equally complete in like manner, and that's a very weak illustration. In like manner, um, God has this image of complete, completeness for us, and that's what Jesus is about. That's what the whole salvation experience is about. It's not us getting fire insurance. It's us being the people of God, complete. Again, the, the, the bride of Christ, pure, spotless, without blemish, presented to Jesus. That's John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions is about a wedding scene. And in that day, uh, the, the boy, once he has his bride, goes home, and the father's daddy controls the timing of all of it. He gets his portion from daddy, whatever it is, be it a corner in the house or be it a separate house on the property. He gets his corner, and when the father is satisfied that all the preparations are ready, he'll say, son, go get your bride. And that's the imagery Jesus uses for us collectively. And that's the better resurrection. Since God had planned something better for us, lest without us they should be made complete, therefore. That is, for all the reasons mentioned, the, what, what, what these people are is they're the standard of faith. They're living proof that you really can live a life of faith. How many of you have said, well, it was easy for them, they knew Jesus? It was easy for them, you know, for whatever reason, you think that somebody else living a life of faith was easy. No. The people raised here all faced (coughs) difficult circumstances for the simple reason they were difficult. Well, they was all persecuted back then, and the Christians today are persecuted in a way when you look at it. Well, but I haven't seen someone here in America be cut in half, mm-hmm. lengthwise or sideways. I mean, no, but when you get over, you get over. Yeah, the you do. And, and you do. You do. Their their faith has to be just like it was in the prehistoric it, time, the biblical times. Exactly, but the argument from Hebrews would be. The reason they're able to do that is partially because they're able to look look back and say, if the disciples were willing to die for their faith, they must have known something, you know, that that we need to hold to, that the faith is really real. We don't need to be told that, you know, come to Jesus and everything will be easy. That I was listening to one of my uh, blogs, uh, audio blogs, the other day about how angry the Chinese were that had come to faith in Christ um, after um, Christians in America could reconnect with with Chinese converts and. Uh, one guy is professor at Asbury, and the other guy is president of Fire University. I can't think of either one's name right this second, but they're having this dialogue about do you believe in the rapture? And one of the things that was so upsetting to the Chinese Christians that they had been taught there's going to be a rapture where all the believers are going to be taken out of this horrendous situation. And they said, we had to live through it. Don't talk to us about an escape plan. God's plan is we had to go back and search the scripture for ourselves and realize there is no rapture. There is a second coming. Those are not the same things. And and the second coming uh, doesn't prevent us from going through horrible times. We're going to go through horrible times. And you need strong faith. And the only reason you can have strong faith is you believe something better is coming. 
But the, the more you, you uh, hang toward Christ and be closer to Christ, the more persecuted uh, your life becomes because of Satan on it, trying to steer you away. And so the most perfect example of faith is Jesus himself. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. And this is for you, Jerry. For the joy set before him. Joy? The cross? Joy? Being beaten before the cross, being publicly humiliated, being rejected by man. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The only reason you could say that's joy is because something better is coming. A better resurrection. For the joy. So that's why we got to look forward to. Exactly. And that's why we should have strong faith. And that's why in today's world you need strong faith. And we need to start passing that on to our kids and our grandkids instead of a weak, wimpy faith. Come to Jesus and everything will be great. Mm-mm. Uh-uh. That is not, that message is from the pit of hell. Now, I, I, I went quickly over the first verse and half so I could get to what I wanted Jerry to hear about Jesus. I mean, he's he is the example. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, this is, this is a tremendous thing. The imagery here is of a marathon race. Life is a marathon race. Uh, if you get in big marathons like the Boston Marathon or, you know, New York Marathon, there's so many people you can't start at the same time. Mm-hmm. They they start in groups, and and you have a, t- a starting time, and 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 so because they start in groups uh, at different times, you finish at different times. It's a staggered finish, and we don't know who's the winner until all the times have been compared. You know, except somebody who comes in in the middle of the night, like twelve hours after the race starts. You know, that guy lost. <laughs> but at least he finished. And that's the imagery that's used here. Only those that started before us, the Hebrew saints, those that started, they didn't just, when they crossed the finish line, they didn't just go to the showers and, you know, go take a break. They stand around the finish line and cheer us on. And they're saying from the portals of heaven, you can do it. And since we are surrounded by these great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. Notice everything that hinders is not saying everything bad. It's saying anything that prevents you from being um, in faith is the way it was presented to me. The good is the enemy of the best. You know, um, if 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 I take up something that's good that prevents me from living fully in faith, you know, take up a hobby. This is probably not the best time to share this illustration. But in First Corinthians seven, you know, in verse eight, Paul talks about you know. Uh, himself as being single and you know it's best to be single like me you know because you know you don't have all the concerns of a wife who wants a barn door and a new bathroom and all this crazy <laughs> stuff and you know thousands of anyway but your life would be boring yeah oh my goodness but you know, he, he talks. Um, now, he also goes on and talks about the blessing in that verse about the blessing of marriage. But uh, let's 
come out to the unmarried and the widows, I say to you, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if, like Earl, they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate herself from her husband, if, but if she does, she must remain unmarried. Uh, go ahead down to the next. To the rest, I say this, not I, but the Lord. If a brother has a wife who is not a believer and she's willing to live with him, do not divorce her. You know, there's, he gives an expanded, but he, he says that, you know, uh, it's good for a person to remain single because their only concern is the Lord. Now, that is the rationale behind the Catholics having celibate priests. I would remind you of the incident in the Catholic Church today of them having difficult matters related to celibate priests. <laughs> Genuinely called to a celibate life for Christ, God bless you. I have known one. I know one brother. I can say he was called to that life, and he's happy in that life, and God bless him. I'm glad I didn't have his calling. Yeah. But that's, you know, throw off everything that hinders, whatever it is, the good being the enemy of the best. And the sin, all right, there's the bad stuff. You miss the mark. The sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. How do we run this race? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer. Pioneer, he's the first. He's the example. He's the author and perfecter. Teleotus, our old friend Telios, has now become a person, the old friend uh, our old friend perfection or completeness now is a person. He is a perfector, one who enables us to reach our full potential. For the joy set before us, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's the right hand of the throne of God that gives us the image that we're in the kingdom, that this is the completeness of the kingdom of God. Now, again, you know, to continue that, you look at the Revelation 21 and 22 especially. But that's the completeness. That's the better resurrection. All right, that's my quick take on it. What is your thoughts, your comments? Your comment about accepting the fall of Christ is easy for my footnote says, to follow Christ, to commit to marriage, to parent a child, to serve a stranger, and to respond to a vocation, moves us in trust to places we cannot now see. Faithful living is edgy, unpredictable, adventuresome, and scary. Amen. 